Well, you were here these last few days. Yeah. Yes. So you were here when when I explained the the, the Mary and Jane analogy. Mary falls asleep in Amsterdam. She dreams the streets of Paris within her own mind. But in order to view the streets of Paris, she ent enters her own imagination and she becomes Jane on the streets of Paris from whose point of view she sees the streets of Paris. Okay, so let's use that, that analogy. From Jane's point of view, everything on the streets of Paris seem to be outside of herself and separate from herself and made out of something other than herself. Yes? So from Jane's point of view, she is a, a mind in a body. The knowing with which she knows her experience seems to reside in her body. She has no idea that the knowing with which she, Jane, knows her experience is, really belongs to Mary's mind asleep in Amsterdam. So she feels, I am a separate mind that lives in my body and is a byproduct of my body. From the point of view of that mind, everything that takes place outside of her is is at a distance from her separate from her made out of something other than her so this something other than her is what's called matter so from jane's point of view experience is always by definition divided into two ingredients mind on the inside and matter on the outside that's how it always appears from jane's point of view of course from mary's point of view when mary wakes up what seemed from Jane's point of view to be mind on the inside and matter on the outside is from her point of view one seem seamless whole all made out of her own consciousness. So Jane's finite mind and the world made of, out of matter are both modulations of Mary's single consciousness. So now you, you in, in uh, you are Jane. You're John in this case. Mary dreams that that she's John in a laboratory in uh, where do you live? In Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. So um, Mary dreams that she's John studying biochemistry at university in in Amsterdam. So from John from from your what's your name? Leonard. 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 Sorry, Mary dreams that she's Leonard studying biochemistry in um, a university in Amsterdam. So from Leonard's point of view, it's inevitable and unavoidable that the stuff he is studying seems to be matter, made out of material, dead inert stuff called material that is independent of his own mind, which he considers to reside. I know he doesn't really, but he considers to reside inside <coughs> his, own, his own body. So it's inevitable that your, uh, so the difference between you and your, your colleagues is that they believe that the stuff they're studying really is made out of dead inert stuff called matter. Whereas you now have this broader perspective. You know that mind and matter are just... Um, matter is not what we see, it's the way we see. the world, reality, appears to be made out of matter when it is viewed from the point of view of a finite mind. So matter is a, is a way of seeing. It's not what we see, it's the way we see. And it is inevitable and unavoidable, even when we have this understanding, that when we view the world, or when we view reality, let's not call it the world, when we view re reality, from the perspective of our finite minds, it appears to us as a world, a multiplicity and diversity of objects and others made out of stuff called matter. That is a reflection not of what it is, but of the way we see. And that is inevitable in the way we see. We can't get rid of that. That is the illusion, that is Maya. What goes is not the illusion. The illusion remains, but the ignorance goes. The belief goes, but the illusion remains. So don't, don't worry that um, it appears to you that all these uh, um, all these chains um, that, that you're studying that they appear to be made out of uh, molecules and atoms and and 
physical particles. That's the way it appears. That's the way they'll always appear. What's important is that you know that that appearance is is um, that it's the reality of that appearance is very different from what it seems to be. The fact that it seems to be matter and separate from yourself is just due to the vantage point or the from the, the view the point of view from which you see it. In other words, what we see in the world is really a reification of our own minds. Sorry, you were about to say something. Yeah, and why is that so complex and does it so seemingly seems to fit into laws and reactions and it also works. We yes, can create yes, yes. But, but why should we be surprised that as consciousness contracts into a finite mind, why should we be surprised that, that, that this collapse or contraction into a finite mind does not take place according to certain laws or habits? Why not? If, if the infinite consciousness has to become a finite mind, it has to do so through a process of contraction. It, it does so through a, a series of filters, as it were. And that, that process, uh, there's nothing to, no reason why that process should not have, a, uh, have laws or patterns or habits. In other words, I'm not suggesting that the, what we now call the laws of nature are not, are not real laws. I'm just upgrading the laws of nature and, and considering them to be laws of mind, not laws of matter. They are laws that govern the way our mind unfolds in consciousness, rather than laws that govern the way matter behaves outside consciousness. But there can still be laws that govern the unfolding of mind in consciousness. Almost as if mind has to convince itself with all these laws, that it seems plausible that all these things take place and work in the way they work. Yes, you, you, could, you could say that, yes. And, and because mind is, because each of our minds is a result of this process of contraction, therefore, therefore our minds are subject to the laws through which they have evolved. So our minds are, so, so that there is a symmetry between what we see out there and the mind through which they are perceived. Because what we see out there is always seen or known in, through the filter of the mind's limitations. So there is a, what corresponds, uh, there's a correspondence between the inside and the outside. Because the outside is a reflection of the mind through which it is seen. There is a corresponding between the orange snow and the orange glasses. When you put on orange glasses, you don't see green snow. There is a very close correspondence between the limitations of the mind, the orange glasses, and the way reality appears. Is it surprising that, 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 that we have five senses? Is it a coincidence that we have five senses and that there are only five ways, f five forms in which the way the world appears to us? The world only appears to us as sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells. Is it a coincidence that our mind only consists of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting and smelling? <laughs> There's a very close correspondence between them. If we had only four of those senses, the world would only appear to us in four forms. Or if our mind were capable of eight different senses, then the world would have eight different forms. There would be five other ways of perceiving the world, which our minds cannot conceive because it's limited to five senses. So there is this very tight correspondence between our minds and the world. Why? Because they are refractions of the same indivisible whole. One is the subjective 
element of that whole, and the other is the ob objective element of it. But they are, they are really one, they're not really separate from each other. Could that also, exp is, is there some kind of limits if you look into, I just read a little bit about quantum mechanics and about how things in quantum mechanics cannot be explained, that even physics say that it's like magic. Would that indicate that there's some kind of limit? Limit to? To how the mind, in my own words then, convinces itself of the reality in which is... Well, the, the mind is itself a limitation of the reality that it is seeking to know. Because the mind is not something apart from reality, it, it is obviously a part of reality, but it is obviously a limited version of that reality. So everything, in other words, reality knows itself through the agency of each of our minds. But everything it knows of it, everything reality knows of itself is limited by the limitations of our mind. That is why we, we cannot say that all there is to reality is the content of our minds. There may be very much more to reality than the content of our own minds. We can't say that because our minds are limited. In other words, our minds filter reality and make reality appear in a way that is consistent with our own limitations. Which is another way of saying the world is a reification of the limitations of our own minds. An objectivization of our own minds. If our own minds were different, the world would be different. But, but any mind if there were different kinds of minds that, that could experience in five or six or seven dimensions, they would still be limited and they would still see a limited version of reality. Unlimited reality has no form. That which is unlimited has no form. Infinity doesn't have a form. Infinite consciousness has no form. So it's not possible for the finite mind to know reality as it is because it will always see reality through its own limitations. So our finite minds cannot know what, what things really are. Physicists will never find out what things truly are because, uh, with their minds, because their own minds superimpose, their minds superimpose their own limitations on the reality they are trying to investigate. The only knowledge that is independent of the limitations of the mind, the only knowledge that is not subject to the limitations of the mind is consciousness's knowledge of itself. And that is why it is said to be absolute knowledge. It is not relative to the limitations of our mind. So the oh, and that is what absolute that's what meant is meant by absolute truth. The only absolute truth there is is consciousness's knowledge of itself. Because it is not subject to any limitations. All other knowledge and experience is relative to the limitations of the mind through which that knowledge and experience is known. And therefore cannot said to be absolute, it is relative knowledge. So it is impossible for science to know the absolute truth. By science, I mean a, a series of thoughts and perceptions. It is pos impossible for the finite mind to know reality as it is. It will only ever see a, a, a fragmented version, a limited version of reality, and that limited version will be a reflection of its own limitations. But the only knowledge that is free of those limitations is consciousness is knowledge of itself, which is not mediated through the finite mind. It knows itself by itself. To know anything other than itself, consciousness must assume the form of a finite mind and therefore limit itself. But to know itself, consciousness doesn't need a finite mind. It knows itself by itself, in itself, as itself. And that is why this consciousness is knowledge of itself, which is our knowledge of ourself, that is the knowledge I am, 
the simple knowledge, I am, is the highest knowledge there is. It is why it said that I am, the knowledge I am, is God's presence in our minds, in our hearts. Because God, or absolute truth, shines in our experience as the simple knowing of our own uncolored being, the knowledge I am. So right there, at the very heart of our experience, each of us, everybody has access to the absolute truth through the experience simply I am. <laughs>